Uh, thank you all. It's great to be here and part of this fascinating discussion. Um, I want to first of all uh, point out that a lot of what I've been developing over the years is a, the result of a collaboration between myself and Patrick Hoy, who came through Vikram's program, then MIT, and I had the uh, pleasure of uh, co-teaching with Patrick uh, for several years here in Boston. Now he's at Savannah, but our collaboration continues. I have some syllabi from him uh, that represent this approach as well. Um, the reference point I think that is useful to start with uh, is one of the big innovations of uh, Mark uh, Vikram and Frank's book is the abandonment of a bounded geometry. Uh, and I'm expressing it in abstract terms, uh, so that it can be applied equally to the beyond, bounded geometries of the nation state, those pastel colored shapes that you see on global maps that implies a hard and fast boundary, and a similar bounded geometry of chronological periodizations, also a myth of hard and fast boundaries uh, b separating one era from another. And instead, there's a very strong implication of a completely different alternative geometry, which I think holds the key to liberating us from several of the problems we've been discussing, discussing, and that is the geometry of points in time and space and the lines that connect those points. And so to this issue of, uh, that of the issues that have come up, um, that Carla mentioned and Jonathan continued um, about the importance of case studies. Uh, I had the challenge of being part of the teaching staff for Harvard's uh, very popular undergraduate course, The Landmarks of World Architecture, uh, which takes the ridiculous, it seemed to me at the time, approach that we're going to uh, spend two full class periods on a single building. And we're only going to do 12 buildings in the entire course. That's it. Which, of, of course, is ridiculous. But, um, and actually, I, I remain highly critical of that. But it was an education into how not so ridiculous it was. It was actually quite successful. Uh, not wanting to do that, um, I, and I think that an equally viable case can be made for uh, the importance of long narratives. Uh, Michelangelo's brought, brought this up in between, uh, and, and Adnan's, uh, the criteria of an inclusion and exclusion according to the stories. And, um, and then Sibel was most articulate about this, uh, having to balance the selection of specific work along with the kinds of stories that those specific works allow you to tell. And I tell my students that you, you're not allowed to tell me anything that you haven't already shown me. Uh, because uh, the periodization that I live with day to day is before lunch, it's history. After lunch, it's studio. And so after lunch, I say, ah, ah, ah. you're not allowed to, are you showing me or are you telling me? You know, I don't want, you're not allowed to say anything they're not showing me. So starting with the case, um, it, it implies a completely different geometry. You have to have a point before you can tell the story that connects one point to another point, and you avoid the, the colored uh, zones unless you're at the architectural scale. So maps become really important, and one of the central mechanisms of, ori of uh, Orientalism, as pointed out by um, Said, is this type of geometry of us and them, uh, and not so much better when you get down in detail to the colonial uh, separation, di dividing up of of a place like Africa. And this also is informed by the revolutionary work of Edward Tufte, the father of information design, who uh, the central premise of which is, of course, uh, meaning doesn't just come from the data itself. Meaning comes as much or more from the visual representation of data. And so this map of Napoleon's march, uh, it's, it's actually something tough, most of Tufte's most valuable uh, Examples come somehow from a spatial uh, representation. So mapping remains one of the great uh, mechanisms of information design. Um, John Snow's map of cholera cases solving the problem of uh, cholera is a waterborne disease. 
uh, et cetera, is an example of that. And so it's very difficult and challenging to find maps that are represented in this point and line mechanism. This is a, a population density map of much of Asia, which I like to use a lot because it points out that where the action is, is actually very different from those big pastel colored shapes. Um, and the trade routes that uh, connect these points, these lines are crucial at every period throughout history. And so um, instead of the Roman Empire being represented like that, uh, it's useful to represent the Roman Empire like this as a dynamic thing over time. And of course, our tools allow us to do this. And a big part of what we've come to know is the spatial turn in the social sciences, and more specifically, this thing that is called digital humanities, which is, of course, a horrible name. Never name a field of study after the tool that you use. Um, but basically, the humanities has gone spatial. And it allows you to disaggregate these large phenomena that previously you could only talk about at the scale of the nation state. But now you can talk about much more specifically, uh, which is the key to true understanding. Um, in Hans Rosling's uh, disaggregated economic data on Gapminder is an example of that. Uh, and so these new tools uh, are allowing us to become much more sophisticated and specific about the actual forces that are operating and the actual geometries through which this occurs. Even this is inadequate because it's still using pixels instead of uh, vector um, graphics so that would emphasize lines. And so on Tuesdays, I give uh, this syllabus that's in here represents uh, a point and line structure of modern global history of architecture. On Tuesdays, we focus on one case study and then uh, extrapolate from that. The case study itself has an implications for the criteria of judgment. In this case, a Dutch um, colonial construction trying to create a hybrid formation that doesn't uh, venerate Javanese or Sundanese or, Sumat or uh, Menangkabau, but to kind of bring them together to legitimize Dutch colonialism in the 20th century under the ethical policy of the Dutch. And in order to really understand it, you have to understand, of course, the indigenous vernaculars, how the Dutch technological trust system is brought into it, and the mechanisms of hybridization where <coughs> One of the most important words in Javanese is basically the verb to Javanize something. So the Baroque architecture of the palace, the drum band, the Dutch uh, tuxedo coat with the tails clipped so you can put the Javanese sword, the batik, the fez from the, uh, the Middle East. Uh, it all comes together as a completely authentic Javanese uh, cultural construct uh, that these things have been absorbed and adapted much like uh, the other elements that are available. Um, the architect uh, did not know how to create these vernacular structures. Um, <clears throat> the argument between the two parties was that the only venerable architecture was the dead architecture of the great stone monuments. Here's Borobudur again. Um, and it was completely implicated by the global discussion. Uh, Berlacha comes in, uh, visits Java, and enters into the argument. Dutch European architecture is asserting itself. Uh, the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo is the model for another building a few kilometers away from the key case. So based on this one building in this one town in Java, it's a vehicle for going through the entire uh, argument uh, that connects this one building to uh, a network and the tectonics, we go into uh, Frampton's uh, studies in the tectonic and how meaning is created through every detail. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be a, a swooping roof. It's not a sign of decadence as argued by the Dutch, uh, the other Dutch uh, architects. And this was proven in some of my research in Java um, where everything is both uh, structural and uh, has a religious meaning. The carpenter is also a priest. And the Dutch architect goes on to experiment wildly with these swooped forms, which continues today to this uh, Aga Khan Award finalist in Bali, bringing back, trying to convince people that bamboo is not just for peasants. Um, it's actually for rich foreigners. Uh, but eventually, <laughs> um, 
these are most the most expensive uh, houses in Southeast Asia are these bamboo things without air conditioning um, uh, that are being experimented with in Bali. But these examples uh, that involve indigenous practices, here's the village uh, architect priest uh, designing in the service of this Western uh, Canadian jewelry designer uh, who really doesn't care if he's in Bali or Cincinnati. Uh, he just wants to make these cool forms. But in the meantime, there's a hidden uh, manuscript that uh, this priest architect is engaged in. And so um, that's just a quick example of the kind of specific case study that allows, after you do that on Tuesday, on Thursday, you get to how these lines connect. And I don't have time to get into the connections, but the Thursday version of this topic, which is colonialism, uh, would take us uh, to the aesthetic movement in London that was embraced in the Meiji Restoration in Tokyo, uh, completely divorced with the, from the forces of the formation of the aesthetic uh, style, and it became the imperial style of Tokyo uh, and spread to Japan's uh, colonies in Seoul, in Taipei, uh, taking on completely new meanings even though it's the same form, the same vocabulary illustrating the slippage of meaning, even though the form is the same. Um, and so it spreads from there. We talk about the opium wars in China and how uh, the, the Bund formed in Shanghai that set this situation for modern day Shanghai and the Pudong. And uh, so these things, the, the thread, the line that connects from the original case study can take in and encompass on Thursday, the need for coverage that we were just talking about comes in. And now you can, once you have one solid anchor point for the story of colonialism, you can now drop down lots of other anchor points uh, without getting lost. And so the coherent uh, thread of the story ties together these specific examples. And you can actually uh, use very few examples, and now you have reference points from which to triangulate anything. Um, but of course, this leaves out the other issue which came up, which was, what about those things that are not part of a global story? And I think of these things as world systems coming out of Wallerstein's world systems research in the 70s. Uh, these world systems uh, do not cover everything, uh, all phenomena. And so the, what are the white spaces? Um, well, first of all, it's surprising the extent to which every important point on the globe has been tied together by different lines, whether it be pilgrimage routes or port cities or trade or uh, you know, cultural diffusions, um, to use that word. Um, but there are still white spaces that have not been touched. And I found uh, James C. Scott's book, The Art of Not Being Governed, particularly instructive of how the people occupying the white spaces that don't appear as part of any of the, the networks that we use uh, to pull together things on Thursday uh, covers the white spaces. Uh, actually, one particular white space of Indochina between the nations, and they've managed for most of human history to stay out of the hair of, of nation states, um, something that Ulrich Beck, would, who has written extensively about the importance of moving beyond the artificial constructs of nation states. But the geometries and the means of mapping uh, have become so rich. Uh, Google Earth cannot do this yet, but um, anticipating the moment when it can, these are the kinds of mappings that are becoming available to us to move away from the bounded conditions of nation states of periodization. You can do dynamic animations where things flourish and dynamically as the years go by, not the hours as in this case. Um, and uh, they can really uh, help us be more matter of fact about the actual reality of these phenomena. And we can, the way we draw them, uh, with the way we map them, can actually become meaningful tools for not uh, confusing uh, the reality of the situation. And finally, the last point is really that the most important bounded conditions uh, for us to overcome are the bounded conditions of disciplinary uh, boundaries. I was lucky to be able in attendance at the American Association of Geographers in Los Angeles, uh, 
And they are quite a uh, matter of fact in a refreshing way. They don't talk about interdisciplinarity. They talk about the new condition of the social sciences, which is uh, a, a unified, well, not quite unified, but it's a cosmopolitan model of disciplines where there was no, only about half the people at this, uh, organ at this event associated with departments of geography, and the rest were from all over God's green uh, disciplinary map. Um, and everyone was coming together, and every session was a very uh, diverse community, uh, a diverse ecology of intellectual tools that all were coming together with the same goal of trying to understand the phenomena that we were looking at. Um, so I'll leave it at there. Thank you. Thank you.